blood. So the next time we're going to do a cultural blood count on you, a complete blood count on you, that means they're looking at red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. And in, here we, we're going to see, of course, the most abundant of red blood cells because they're in the veins. So on an average blood, red blood count, we should have anywhere between four to six million, depending on male or female. Four to six million. And what's the job of the red blood cell? So it's got an important molecule in there called what? The heme molecule. The tertiary structure, meaning it's a four, a four-sided protein. It's a big protein. And for each one of them, it will have it will hook to four molecules of iron, which means it will carry four molecules of oxygen. So each one hemoglobin carries four oxygen. So they do a great job of oxygenating it, but that's good in physiology now, because you can have that's test questions every so in that case, we always hear about, so we know hemoglobin, and a normal hemoglobin ratio usually is anywhere 12 to 16. It's a normal hemoglobin molecule, 12 to 16 percent of whole blood. So what do they mean by that? It's just telling you the oxygen carrying capacity of your blood. And if you go below the 12, then they say you're anemic. anemic. And if your red blood count drops, you're anemic. So usually someone that would have the most common anemia is? Oh, I just have it too, and I don't even know. IDA, iron deficiency, is the most common. Why is it so much more common in females than they don't talk iron? Because they're what? I didn't mention them exactly because they're, they're menstrual. Yeah, right, because they lose a volume every 28 days. More than males. Or some of them have internal bleeding and stuff like that. So the point is if, if you have a blood loss, you're going to be going to an IDA. If you have malabsorption problems, you can have an IDA. So depending when you diagnose that into a patient, you have to figure out why is it happening. Okay, why is it happening? This person has a chronic bleed somewhere in the drop, or are they factor deficient, meaning they're not utilizing iron, they don't have transferrin protein anymore, producing enough to transfer, transport the, the iron over to, to the hemoglobin molecule. You know, so there's a lot of, oh, then you have malabsorption, you have a lot of, uh, this is one of these products which is inhibiting the ion absorption in the stomach from the food. So you've got to really dig into it. So, but IDA, or iron deficient anemia, or ferrous deficient, is the most common anemia. And normally you would see the hemoglobin would come down, the radical drops, and your total red blood count would shift. So if it was a female, it might be around 3.7. Your hemoglobin might be around 11 to 10. Goes on around seven, you're gonna get a transfusion, or you're gonna die. But you're down, you know, so she might be around 10. Between 10 to 11. So let's say it's slightly anemic, but I put you on 100 milligrams of ferrous a day. <coughs> about 100, you're gonna absorb 20. That's it. So to put you on 20 is the weight, so you're gonna absorb 4 points. So you at least put you on that dose. All right? And if you're on the antacids, you don't know, absorb any of it. You take it with milk, you don't absorb it. So, <laughs> So it's harsh on the stomach lining. Okay, so you, you do need to get it in here. Depending on how low your DD is. So that's your most common type. Then there's another type which is common known as pernicious anemia. Pernicious, PA, pernicious anemia, and that's B12 deficiency. B12. So what would that look like? Well, kind of similar picture. This goes down. Again, total red blood cell count would be down. My, my total hemoglobin would be low. There's other things they look at to delineate what am I dealing with here. And it's called indices, which I'm not going to get into, but it's actually going to tell you the color of the cell, the size of the cell, the shape of the cell. And usually in, a, in an IDA, you have a hypochromic microcytic anemia. But in a B12 anemia, I have 
have a macrocytic hyperchromic anemia. I don't know if I touched that on the spot. This is how they do it. This is how you delineate. So now you see that. Because to do just a CBC without indices and a diff on the white blood cell, you're wasting your time. You need to break this all down and see really what's happening in the first place. And you would see this change, say, so, okay, so it's relating to the B complex part. Now, if I put you on a B complex, your picture will look like it's getting better, but you're not. Because folic acid would also be absorbed similar to B12. So B9 will be absorbed like B12, but it's not eliminating the neurological problem that's eventually going to happen to you. So you'd have to test for intrinsic factor because that's missing in the gut to absorb the B12. We don't have it. So what they have to do, we have to inject it in you once a week or sublingual with a thousand microunits a day where it absorbs under the tongue to get it into the body. And the anemic picture will clear up. But this time you know the patient's going to be bad. So those are your two most common pernicious anemia and iron deficiency. This is the most common anemia. Now, can we have an increase in red blood cells, like cancer of the red blood cell, which is not as bad as it is with leukemia? And the answer is yes. It's called polycythemia vera. Polycythemia vera. We would run a blood count on a patient, and their, their red blood cells are like seven, you know, seven to eight million, and their hemoglobin is like 18 to 19. Wow, they're really healthy, aren't they? No. It's like sludge moving through this. Explicit people literally can't breathe. They get so bad. As an intern, I had one of these cases. She had polycythemia and beer. We had to do it. Go donate a pint of blood every 10 weeks. Bleed her off, and she goes right back to normal. Would they have like high blood pressure? No. Blood? She can make just use They just have a lot of problems with no, it wouldn't be enough. What did you so, say the red blood count was? I mean, the red blood count, what did you say it was? It would be, it could be up like in seven to eight million. Right, and you, you could also have your, you know, your uh, hemoglobin sitting around like 18. So yeah, if you healthy blood pressure, no, but you get too many of these, this is like sludge, it doesn't want to move. So a lot of pulmonary edema in these people, and eventually they, you know, they do for heart failure because you put so much pressure against the heart. Choke. And then you <coughs> choke. So then she um uh, uh, so that's what we do. Like I say you go donate blood this weekend. She will follow away and she'd be bad for herself. Full of life again. So there are so that takes care of our red blood cells. So the blood that she's doing, was it fine to stick in something else or have so much extra junk in Well, they take, they just take, they get rid of the whole blood. They get rid of the cell body and just use the plasma. Right? You can do that. Oh, piece of crap. Oh, All right. So then we, then, let's go to the white blood cells. Why do we have white blood cells? I mean, the function. Exactly. To fight off infection. That's its job. So it's our defense system. And they're known as leukocytes. And we break them into five types. You know, two big major ones that you're seeing here. You're seeing the lymphocyte and you're seeing the neutrophil. Well, this guy likes to fight off bacteria, that one viruses. We're going to get to that. So the next would be your monocyte. Basils and eos, you really don't see much of the normal smear unless you have a parasitic problem or allergic reaction. That's an increase. But these two, this one especially, how do you know you got a bacterial infection? Um, this takes out most of your count anyways, but now it's really taken up. And they'll say you have a shift to the left. A shift to the left means I have a ton of premature neutrophils, PMNs, in there with showing I need a lot of them because I got an acute infection. My white blood count is only 5 to 10,000, 5,000 to 10,000. I want to see my white blood counts up around 13,000. To shift to the left. I got acute bacterial infection. In cases of appendicitis, we're going to like 17, 18,000. So that means get in there and get it out. This thing is ready to burst. That's premature neutrophils? That would be with the, with the infection due to a bacteria. So that's what the, you know, and the thing is, when you get blood results, people, unless you're blind, you should never figure them out. 
because they actually put a little h next to it if it's high, a little l if it's low, and they give you the normal ranges. The thing is, you've got to understand what each one is there for. And believe it or not, I've been with associates, and they're like, oh, this person, another person, that's normal. They had a true infection, and then it's in the, the kidney, for God's sake. You can't see that? I said, you better call the patient back. Tell them, no, you got to get in, you got to end up with an antibiotic in there. No. I said, where's the same normal? We got increased white blood count, we got blood, you know, uh, CBC, we got blood in the urine, we got leukerase in the urine, which means I got breakdown of white blood cells, and you know, lower where white blood cells can put high, high power feet. So you're telling me this is a normal urine. So it gets missed. But what are you going to do? It happens. Now, if I had a, a viral infection, my lymphs would be increasing in normal. And your muscles. But the lymphs first. The lymphocytes will go out. Your TB lymph nodes are the ones that go out and take care of uh, the virus. Now, but the total count shifts down. It might drop to 10,000. You're not be sitting around 9,800. 9, now your white blood count is sitting around 8,500. With a big shift to the right of lymphs. So now we know we're dealing with an acute viral attack. Comes to shifting itself around to fight it off. Now, monocytosis, which is a virus, the monocytes will increase. So they run the mono spot and they see it. In early phases, though, you may not see it. The mono not be, might not be reacting right away at the monocyte. So the lymphocyte and the monocyte are viral related. So you might not see that. So you run a total count and you look at 30% atypical looking lymph because they're reacting first. You see that, you get to the diagnosis of mono in the patient before you even do the mono spot. Because sometimes in the early phases, the mono spot might be negative. But then as the disease sets in, the glands will start swelling, you know, all the nodes around the throat swollen, the spleen swollen, the different swells, so there you go. So, so the mono site and the lymphocyte viruses the neutrophil, bacteria, the eels and the basil, they're really, really there. You really don't see them. They're there are more to fight. Like somebody's having an allergic time, they know they increase. They don't increase that big, you might see 10. You know, so they don't increase that drastic. And parasitic infections too increase even more. Like the basil, the basophils, and the eosinophils. Okay, so you'll go into detail much more than we're doing here in fits and anatomy. Anatomy just know there's white blood cells, there's five types, maybe these two, that's it. I think we the other time in detail of that. Okay? So then we get lastly to the platelet. The platelet usually sit, depending on the cup that we're using, 150 to 350,000 is normal platelet count. They're for blood clot. And they're short lived. Like, they're, they're the toughest one. When they draw blood out of people to collect, you know, whole blood and so forth, within three days, they're going to the workers. They don't live on the platelets. So they're constantly looking for platelets. What's the count? 150 to like 350,000. Not 150, 150,000, 350,000. That's what I mean when I say that. Okay, so they're, so they're like very short lived platelets. But they're there for one thing. Why not? The conversion of, you know, the program and the drama. That's what you mean. And that's a very complicated thing. You're going to learn that in physiology. Now that you just well, didn't teach you that, or Dr. Craig teach you that. They didn't teach you that wonderful stuff. That's when I say, thank God we're not doing this. Because that's confusing. The extrinsic versus the intrinsic pathways of it. Just the fact seven versus five K. So we need to go from there. Now we're going to get into circulatory roots. So these are the arteries, you don't need this anyway, that's bad for you. Why do arteries give pulse points? As we talked about arteries, a muscular, a very muscular wall, a very, very muscular wall structure and your pulse with the heart, a beat with the heart, a rhythm with the heart. 
So wherever an artery surfaces, you have a pulse. But you're all aware. Radial pulse, brachial pulse. You know, so a lot of times they'll have to do blood gases on something. And they'll either go, they go here, if this sucks, they'll go here, and if things really suck, they go here. And it's really uncomfortable when they do that. Okay. You know, usually, most of the time, in cases of what ever done a few years ago, as I'm being bad and doing, not even a tech, a, a vascular surgeon can come in and do it because they missed. The tech did it three times and missed all three times. And it's diet, and you feel it. When they go into that eye, it feels like somebody's got a hot poker and they're sticking it right in you, right through your groin. The blood actually pulses into the, into the thing as they catch it. It doesn't just feel like you see veins just pouring. Now it just pulses in because you're in an eye. So the surgeon, then they have to they put a weight on it and ice over it so it closes up and you don't bleed. So, and you're going to stay laying for like a few hours before you can get up. Especially when they go into the groin. But this, you're like, yeah, they went in here. And they come in at a straight angle. They actually feel the pulse and they come in between it. And they see it shoot in and they know they've hit it. And they missed here and they went here. Come back, oh no, we're going to do another one. They went here. I said, Are you freaking kidding me? That was a fun, a fun event. Hopefully, we're going to do it again. So now we get into circulatory roots. We've done systemic, we've done pulmonary. Now we get into this. And this one here, you're going to have to really kind of know. Because you will be asked this most likely as your essay. Tracing it from umbilical vein back to umbilical artery. So the schematic is what plays the role for you. Now notice in this again, the umbilical vein is very red. Because that's where the oxygen is and all the nutrition this baby needs. Or sees. The arteries are very light pink. If this level is returning back to mom, the oxygen levels are very low. So in a, in a normal umbilical cord, you have one vein and two arteries. One umbilical vein and two umbilical arteries. So the blood traces in from the blood traces in from from mom. Okay, so mom, the blood's tracing in, so here we go. So we're coming into our umbilical vein. And it really isn't hard. You, you guys, if there is really no circulatory roof, so it's not that stinking hot, other than putting a few bypasses in there. So the umbilical vein is bringing in this high oxygenated blood. O2 is very high, and the first thing it's going to hit is the liver area. So we want to bypass liver. So this liver, we have to bypass it. So we want to bypass it. And how are we going to do it? What do we see here? A ductus venosus. So what the ductus venosus is going to do, We're going to bypass the liver by bypassing the hepatic portal system. It's not going to go into it. So this umbilical vein is going to go around the liver. So it's going to come like this, go around the liver, and through this little passageway, it's going to take you right into the inferior vena cable. So what did I bypass that would be in the liver system? I bypassed the hepatic portal vein into the capillaries to the hepatic vein. So you missed all this. We don't need to go in here. All right? So that's what you bypass. So keep that in your head. Think of what the liver does. Drains the gut. I don't need to do this. So that's why you see this ligamentum teres pierces through the liver when you were looking at the, that in the cats. The falciform ligament, ligamentum teres once was the umbilical vein. It's piercing right through to get its way to the inferior vena cava as fast as it can. We've got to get this blood right away to the brain of this fetus so it develops. 
It needs oxygen. So that's the first bypass route, and it's the doctor's medosis. So that's number one. We bypass the liver. From the inferior vena cava, then, we're going to go from where? Normal vena to the right atrium, right? Right atrium. And then from right atrium, normally we go where? Right ventricle, correct? Well, then we have a, a hole in the heart. Well, for even ovale. All right? So we have a hole in the heart. So what are we bypassing here? Lungs. Lungs don't work in the fetus. They're not going to give you oxygen. We don't need to detoxify food. We don't need to synthesize. It's already been done by mom. We'll store it thereafter, but we don't need to do anything with it right now. You understand? We don't need to. That nutrition can blow right in. That, that's all been detoxed by mom. So that placenta is the detox organ. That placenta is the lung that's doing everything for the, for the fetus. So we're going to bypass the lungs. So this is your second bypass route. And how does it do it? Well, it passes through a doorway known as foramen ovale. And it's going to take me right into left atrium. So it's a simple, I'm here, and now I'm here. And then where do I go from this one? Well, I go down here into the left ventricle. In the ventricle, left ventricle, I go to AOR. So I'm right, I don't care about the valves. When you do this thing, don't worry about the valves, okay? We're not doing tracing a drop of blood. We're, not. We're, we're more concerned about bypass routes. So on this, you're forgiven from valves. If this happens to be your question. I've been working on the food I'm pulling out, playing with. They're going to be different. Each group will have a different essay. So O3 and O4 will have one. O1 and O2 has one. In the night, Saturdays, they have, their, they have a different one. So you're not getting the same. So each year all you want, but when you're dealing with the difference, you're not going to help us. So it's one way to knock out this black and outside the classroom. Why does it go in the right atrium twice? Why, why is it's a left. That's L. Uh. Left atrium to left ventricle. No, no, sir. So now, some blood, though won't get through this bypass, correct? Some are going to go into where? Right? Ventral. Correct? That makes sense, right? And then from here it goes where? Pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary trunk and artery are not the same thing. Arteries come after. The point losses on the practical. Half a point. At least you put pulmonary, so you lose a half a point. If I was Professor Royal or any other professor from the other campus, it's totally wrong. It's not the right answer. I give you some credit. So you won't bitch about me that there's no damn good. So think of that. Okay. So what happens here? Well, pulmonary trunk is going to connect to the aorta. Ductus arteriosus. This is my third bypass route. So, both of us are now at the AOR. So, for my auto, where do we go? Systemic, right? Now, where do we keep going? All right, so now we're in the aorta, so we go descending aorta. Right, so our course is going to go to the head, but we're going to just focus the descending aorta. So we're going to go look, descending aorta, the common iliac arteries, right? And then from common iliac, then we're going to find a branch into the internal. So this yeah. is after the aorta? Well, yeah. If I'm just... How do you become a descending aorta? Okay. My dear, you asked me that question. I was taking a practice. You didn't do that right now. You did. You 
You'd be surprised how much lower a lot of people score than yours. We had ranges from zero to like 98 or 99 in this, this section. About three. So. There's a big range. Okay, so internal iliac. Look at this picture. Where does it go? Internal iliac. Oops. Umbilical artery comes off this line. Go to umbilical artery. And then where does it go? Back here where the placenta would be. So here's your placenta. So this came in this way, and it goes back out that way. It recycles through mom, and the whole process starts over again. There you go. So I'm giving you guys a break. So if you do get this question, that's how you write it up. Or just write it up. Bypass route one, bypass route two, bypass route three. So now you ask what happens when you're born. Well, when we're born, we go to the next one. The new born. What's going to happen is when the baby comes out, and they give you that good ass and it starts screaming. When it goes to cry, what's it going to do? It's going to suck air in. So who just sucks air in? The lung will inflate. So with those lungs that inflate, it will cause a negative feedback pressure back up into the vascular system, which slams all these doors shut. Yeah, that's how it does it. And they'll slam shut, and they'll hold themselves shut, and become ligamentous shut. So they always do that? Yes, and we'll get into that. And that's the second part of the answer. So this is worth 10 points. Oh, look at her face. Are you kidding me? What do you think? I don't want to know when it goes into the... No. No, no, no. Because there's no rules for all. I'm just caring about how to get there and back. That's all I'm asking. We're just doing just basic fetal rules. Because the, the way it works the other way is the normal way it works in all of us, so we don't care about that. The tracing the drop of blood in the heart didn't worry about that. It just traced it. We just did it to the lung. But of course, it goes other places once it got to the, you know, systemic. So yeah, you're kind of going systemic here, but systemic is going to move itself back towards placenta. It has to. And it doesn't to long down the arteries, okay? Now, we say, this happens. So the first thing that's going to happen then, the first door shutting is my ductus arteriosus now becomes ligamentum arteriosus, which you saw on the practical. That was on your block. Told you, David. <laughs> yeah, just giving answers away to people taking it today. Inside the heart, the foramen ovale now becomes fossa ovalis. So that's the second drug. 
That's the second door to close. Our next door to close is the ductus venosus becomes ligamentum venosus. That would be deep in the liver. You'd have to dissect the liver out to see that. Then, umbilical vein becomes ligamentum teres, which is primarily all your belly bone. Can I just, this is when the baby is born. It's born. Okay. So who's it's born? It might take a day or two sometimes, and they watch that the baby's going to go out got school. But so that ductus venosus, I don't see that in the... Oh, you won't see it. What do you mean? Oh, here. So it's the first one. Yeah. It's our first one. So one bypass is the liver, two bypass lungs. Let's put that in your head. One liver, two lungs. And the two in the lungs you've seen in the lab. You know them. So those you usually don't forget. So don't forget the one in the liver. Okay? Think of why. Look, understand why you have to bypass. And then you don't forget it anymore. At the same time, I'm trying to prep you for physiology. Because physiology is understanding all functions. There's a lot less memory. It's like math. You, you learn a formula, and then you learn how to apply it to 10 different things. When to apply it. Physiology is kind of that way. So it's all concepts. So there's a lot less memory, a lot less understanding and using it. Where this is mainly 70% memory, 30% function. There it's the opposite like 80% function, 20% memory. That's why, to me, phys is always easier than that. Because once you understand it, you know it, you just take it and put it in each system, and it kind of does the same damn thing, it goes differently, with a different chemical, but it's doing the same thing. It's osmotic pressure, that's it. The osmosis of a cell membrane, that's all you're really going to understand. You got that, you're fine. <laughs> so then we get, this becomes, the ligament and the tendon. Around the ligament, you feel your belly. You saw that coming in off the cap with the falciform ligament. This one you didn't see because then we got umbilical arteries do two things. They just don't stop at this. They, they'll become umbilical, medial umbilical ligaments, which play a real small role. But the remnants of them will also get branches too coming off with this to the urinary plaque. So some of it will stay feeding urinary blood. So some of the umbilical arteries will feed the urinary blood. Okay? So they, some, a couple, some branches of it will stay functional. And some people, they won't. And that's fetal circulation. This is your hottest, last thing to learn. Now, can we mess it up? Well, yeah, the first mess up is a painting ductus. So, what would be the path pathogenesis of a painting ductus? What do I mean a painting ductus? We can stay open. So, what would the pathogenesis be? Well, the pathogenesis is this I'm mixing oxygen and deoxygenated blood, so I'm carrying maybe, instead of carrying 100% oxygenation through the body, I'm carrying only 60%. Because it's such a mixing of oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood. Because some of it is coming out of the aorta that's been oxygenated, and some are still pouring into the aorta from the pulmonary trunk, which is not oxygenated. So they watch that. They see how the diameter, you know, the ultrasound see the diameter of it. If it's kind of like semi-closed, they'll watch it, put more oxygen into the baby. You know, pressurize the oxygen into the baby and see if that will cause more pressure to close that and also kinds of well. It's not that you watch the movie, it's called What God Created. It's about John Hopkins Medical School in the 30s, late 20s, 30s, where they figured out how the surgery could fix that. So before that, every baby diagram, they didn't know how to fix it. Because you were taught many years ago. In medical school in the early 1900s, you never touch the heart. It's a sin. You don't touch the heart. So the surgeon that's in it's all true story. It's a great movie to watch. It, it comes a tear to you because you're watching it. Um, where God created. And it's about John Hopkins' medical school. 
And it's also means it really is about, and it's because prejudice is the reason you get choked up watching it. It's this black TSA. It's in the movie. And it's a really good movie. You gotta watch it. If you ever can get a chance, watch it. You know, so they make a story out of this, but he's the doctor who invented this way of fixing this. How to do it. And they used to use dogs. Trying to sound dogs. Now, so there's the pain in the doctor. See, look, it should become what? The mental arterials, not state doctor's arterials. So that's the pathology, it didn't close. And what is the pathogenesis? I'm mixing oxygenated and deoxygenated blood together in this aorta. So that's not a good thing. There's your pathogenesis, okay? So, so that's when the ligament um, arterial is not bypassed. No, it's not a bypass anymore, closed. It becomes a ligament, so that it's over. But it was once a bypass. The problem is it didn't close. It's shown the pathology. This is normal. This is the abnormal. This is not a fetus anymore. This is a, a child that's born. So if it stays open, then that's a pathology. It's not supposed to. You know, just think of fetal, cir fetal circulation. Is, is it going to work? If your lungs are working, no. You need to make these roots direct to the lung now. They're not working anymore. Okay, so you basically see the baby's got blue nails, blue lips. Then we go to atrial septal defect. And an atrial septal defect means the foramen ovale didn't close to become a fossa ovalis. It's kind of like you guys poked it so much and made a hole in it again, so you guys recreated this. So what is the pathology of that? That the, the, the atrius, think of the atrius now. Right, where is, where, think of, first of all, stop and think for one minute, just sit here, relax, think. I want you to understand this. And if you understand it, you don't have to memorize it, because you know it. Just sit and relax one minute, because you guys are getting stressed out. I can see it in your faces. So sit and relax. I want you to get it. This is the last hardest thing to learn in this whole course. Reproduction urine is a joke. All the right those systems like they're not. This is the last hardest thing to concept. But if you concept this and understand it, you'll never forget this the rest of your life. This one here now, the hole in my heart did not close. What's going to happen? Blood's coming in from the body into the right atrium. Blood's coming back from the lungs to the left atrium, full of oxygen, very low oxygen here. They're mixing, diluting together as they pour into the left ventricle. So what I'm pushing into my aorta now is a volume of oxygenated blood that's probably at 50%. Okay? Does that make sense to you now? Just sit, relax, think about it. I don't only want you to understand names. I want you to really know this. I want you guys to be able to go into physiology and kick ass there and not stress. Because you really know your anatomy and take its function to the next level. If you do that, you're fine. You are not going to find physiology. I don't know if it's a chemistry crap at the beginning of it. But when you finally get into the true phys, you're going to enjoy it, and you're going to learn so much. That's what I want out of it. I don't want to stress. So the blood of the right atria... Is going to mix into the blood of the left atria. But the right has crappy oxygen? Right, and the left has good oxygen, so now i got mediocre oxygen. Okay. Understand that? That's what's happening. So is that a good thing? No. Can this baby ever be stressed? No. When the oxygen demand comes out to this child, it's going to die. It's not going to have it. So they have to go in and put a plug. They actually patch it. It's amazing. The biggest thing they patch it and put it in there. And you realize how small you're talking? Think of the heart of a fetus. How much bigger than the heart of that cat? And to go in there and do this. So when you think of these surgeons that do this stuff, 
It's not remarkable. We're not talking big hot like this. We're talking something like this. So when you think of these surgeries that they perform and do, it's mind bending. Now, is it more common in like Yes and no. The more common feature of premature baby is not having the, uh, <coughs> the type two alveolus developed yet. It's a fact. That's the most common situation. Depending on how to me, because the heart develops pretty really quick. The heart usually by two months in is almost all developed. So, so it's, a, it's a really developed organ. So the heart should be able to take on a pressure change when the baby breathes. But what can create a problem here? Well, just you just picked it right up because the, the lungs aren't working good, and now this probably not working good to really close down. So we got we got a double problem. So that's why it confused high pressure oxygen into the baby for a good, you know, anywhere from minimal three, four, five days, and watch the baby keep breathing its oxygen levels. So like I have two friends who both work for both their hearts, mm -hmm. so right? And like they had surgery. Yeah, they were really Yeah, they were really That happens later in life, you know, when you're I feel so, so, so empty right here. So that's, now this pathology that we're going to show you. First of all, here's the true blue baby. The true blue baby. <laughs> This is the blue man's group's children. <laughs> They're in the audience. Green water for me. They drink blue water, and that's what happens to them. This is the one we talked about earlier. This one would be the third type condition. This one's a deadly condition. That means you got four problems in the heart. Just look at the picture, and the picture itself tells you what's wrong. I got a thickened ventricular wall on the right side. I have stenosis of the pulmonary trunk. I have a defect inside my ventricle wall. And I got blood blown out from, from both ventricles into the same area. This is a time bound to die. We can't really fix this. So this is an adult, not a kid? No, this is a kid. This is a baby. So how was life expectancy like hours or? Eh, maybe. More than that. Well, look at it, look how it happens. One in every two thousand girls. So if you ever hear the term tetralogy of Fallot, someone's baby was born with that, the, the outcome is not going to be good. But when you get a tragia, you know, a lot of people are born with a tragia of the of the pulmonary trunk. That they need to fix surgically. So just had that one problem. But this thing, this baby's born with cardiomegaly on the right side. How does that happen? Genetic defect. So like chromosomal or like? Could be. Toxins get in. Yeah, I was going to say, could be something mother did too, right? Yeah, baby's born with opiate issue. That was a big piece in the newspaper a few weeks ago. You know, the mother took opioids while pregnant, so now the baby's dependent on drugs. So that means stenosis means it's stuck. The right. It's stuck open. Stuck open. Stuck open. Stuck open. <laughs> means it only opens this big and it's stuck big. So it's nasty. So it's nasty, all these conditions that go on. So, you know, the more you hear about things, it's like, ooh, I don't want to have a kid anymore. You get so nervous. I know, my younger daughter's been pregnant now, she's doing any day, she's driving nuts every day. <laughs> if they did this test, everyone's going to, don't worry about it, will you? None of these things should have to worry about any of us. You didn't do drugs and shit like that, so what are you worried about? You're healthy, you're like, you know, 25, so it's like, you know, you're like that when you're first, but then you get to your third or fourth, like, it's like that commercial show with the person with the big room. Nobody can touch it. Then the last one, she's in the mechanic with the dirty hands. Hey, hold it. <laughs> hold the big one. I need to put my credit card out. 
you change so much. The last, you know, the first one, oh, every little, when the third one, or fourth one's crying, it's like, oh, you get up. You know? <laughs> this is right out of your book, this one, right? Yeah. So this one here now, we're going to our next circuitry move, known as pattern for system. And this is easy, there's only a couple of things to pick up on. And the thing is with this, normally we always go up, artery, capillary, vein, correct? Artery, capillary, vein. So look at the hepatic portal system, vein, capillary, vein. It doesn't follow a normal rule. Because it drains everything from the gut to the liver. And the only way it can drain the liver back to the heart is with the vein. The vein leaves the organ. How do you bring blood into the organ? The vein leaves the organ. But in the case of the liver, yes, we have an artery supply for the liver, of course we do, because we need to make a pressure pipe. But this pressure continues on through. One of my exams in, in, in digestion physiology in chiropractic school was in the one question summarized the whole course. Here's a drop of food, you know, it's a, if you were a bagel, face a bagel with cream cheese from the mouth to anus. Name everything it passes, name every enzyme that hits it, name when it gets into the, into the you know, as it goes through the small intestine, name. What molecules are being broken down, where they're going, and then where they're going to store, and what enzymes to take them to take the kind of white brown, to take the carb, to take the protein, and then what will they break into them, what will they become? So it took you two and a half hours to write that essay, and that was your final. You summarized the whole course in that one time. Not just the physiology, it is the whole semester. So, so, do I know what it is to be tortured in class? Yes. And I really don't torture you like you think I'm torturing me. I just want you to have some knowledge. Convince me you have knowledge. For the borderline student, convince me you have knowledge. Convince me you're worthy. Should, should that be a B minus or should it be a B? B plus or an A? Convince me. So an essay becomes like a redemption for you. Show me that you can reason things out and come up with educated ideas on why it happened. Why is something done? Because I wish this was done with me when I was in your level of education, and it wasn't. I didn't do this to get on for like the third year of medicine. We finally talked about diseases, pathology. And man, I was like running into that wall. Boom! You know, everything normal now. Boom! All the pathologies are thrown at you. So now you're going to make the normal back to the pathology. But if we do it as we go along, you are not going to run into that wall next year at this time when you're in nursing. You realize that things go well for most of you and it should. You'll apply in August, you'll start in January. May I say more to you? You will be in this real world next year. That's only one more semester of academia and you're into the real world. Think about it. The student nurse is above a CNA, remember that. Just keep that in your mind. The CNA is now, but student nurse is a step above. Because you're into the academic of it now when you're in the clinical rotations. Am I wrong? So they expect more out of you than they have now. They're going around and they question you. But if you've read this stuff and have some understanding of it, not a big deal. Not a big deal. So I think to really know out of this system here, what is the only system in the body that doesn't follow that artery, capillary, vein system? Paracordal system. Those vein, capillary, vein, paracordal vein, to the capillaries in the liver, to the hepatic vein to bring it back to the vena cava. So think of your bypass of, your, of, of this guy here. Think of this one here. What's it doing? It's going to go bypass this, 
boom, right here, because I don't want to get stuck in this. So you can see why you don't want to get stuck in that, because you're going to lose so much oxygen in time. That by the time this blood gets to the heart, I've given up already about a good 30% of oxygen. Then if I can go in the lungs and give them another, I have like 30% hitting the brain. I'm going to do a lot of good for that fetus developing by the time these bypass wounds. When I have all children, I forget it. I choose it all the way under 100. That'd be wonderful. Maybe that's happening in the political world this time around. The last system to talk about is what we call collateral circulation. Now, when you think, you think of collateral with a bank, that means you put your car up for a loan, or you put, put it against your house, put it against your kids, so your dribblers don't pay it, so they take the kids away. Save your money in the long run. That'd be nice, we're going to do it right now. I can do it with students. We're losing babies. <laughs> so we get into it. Dave is tied to the. Let's do the Venus one first. It's a little easier to kind of know. Well, the Venus one, a collateral wound would be our friend and yours, the Azygos. Which wasn't on the test, but some people like to call him the, the, you know, the sympathetic with the Azygos for some reason. And I didn't realize we had a carotid nerve. Taught me something I didn't know. Okay. So my carotid nerves. I never knew we had that. I do now you do. Now I do. And it was I was there. I didn't know that. I learned so much. Thank you. You know, I thank you for that. So next semester I won't make that mistake when I'm teaching the class. I'll make sure. <laughs> So we have the inferior vena cava, we have these cycles. Say something happens to my inferior. Think about what, is, what does it mean, uh, bypass a collateral wound if you're driving somewhere? Well, the best example to use is 95 to 295. You're going to Arrow. You're on a 95 block of exit 10, so you just fall asleep. And there's a huge 10 car pile up on 95 block before 37. You're like, shit. You know, I gotta get You know, then I don't know, I don't know if get through any of this. You get up to 95, and just belt you around and bring you down. So one group goes straight, one group belts around. That's what this is doing. So in this case here, if my, which my direct route to my heart, because my heart would be right here, is my inferior vena cava, but for some reason, because the azygos goes down below it, for some reason, this gets occluded, something happens to it, until they can fix it, the azygos can compensate to take this up and bring it to the superior vena cava and get it back to the heart. So the azygos is a bypass or collateral route for the inferior vena cava. It has double function. It already drains the body, it drains the lower body and lower extremities if it has to. Now, the older you get, the more dependent our bodies become on collateral circulation, because the main arteries themselves are not doing what they should do, because someone might be clogging a bit. So the collateral circulation opens up even bigger the vessels to bring the, the blood in. In the case of the arm, I have the brachial and the deep brachial. So here's the brachial, here's the deep brachial. If for some reason we damage this brachial, the deep brachial artery would come around and move right here, a little faster, and would still get blood down into my forearm. So the deep brachial will be the collateral loop for the brachial. Okay, so there's your two. So on the venous side, the zygos is for the inferior vena cava, and the extremity on the arterial side, the deep brachial is for the brachial. That's all you're going to remember. Easy peasy, right? But with the heart, does the heart have collateral circulation? Then the answer is yes. But is it good? No. It sucks. Because if it was good, we wouldn't have to do these things to you. We wouldn't have to put the shunt. I wouldn't have to take you apart and add new arteries to your heart to make it work. 
So I wouldn't have to do bypass. So the answer is, if you ask, does the heart have a true collateral circulation? The answer is yes. But if you get asked, is it true that the collateral circulation of the heart is a very effective system? False. False. So if you ask, does it have it? Yeah, it's true, it does have it. But is it really good? No, it sucks. That's why people die of NLIs. If it was good, you would drop dead. Now, the older you get, the more these other arteries would, would dilate more into the heart because they get more dependent on it. As you get older, you do. The, the main circulation is starting to get a little clogged, like, like the drain pipes in your house. So the accessory drains are working a little better. That's why you get people have a massive heart attack at 38 to 45. Most times they'll drop dead or have real severe cardiac damage. The older person, like 65, 70, suffers a heart attack. They suffer damage. They might come down with CHF after, but probably will live another 10 to 15 years with that over the person who suffered the real severe MI in your age because they'll have less cardiac damage because they have a better collateral loop to have kept the heart alive a little better than the younger persons. So collateral is just an alternative way to get from A to B that takes a little longer. So to keep it in your mind, keep 95 and 295 in your head. If you want to push up and get the ball off the head, I don't know the young ladies in the room. The last thing then, well, I'll show you after scrolls that's what we end with, but I want you to look at this picture. And I want just to keep this picture with you, not only for physiology, but when you go to your nursing. And then what you're going to do with it, I want you to keep this picture and take, get a same picture with the nerves running, the cranial nerves, and overlying it. This is going to help you so much in med surgery too. And I got this from Katie, Katie, our tutor on Saturdays. She's finishing up. Med search three right now in nursing. She's going to four in September. And she's done. And she would have, her and I would go over these things together. She'd show me this stuff, especially when she was two in the fall, and taught me a lot of what you guys and I. Well, this thing right here is known as the circle of Willis, where where the, where the vertebrae come in to make the basilar, and where the carotids come in to form the, all the circulation to the brain. They form this ring. And this ring sits right around the solid tercera. Right around there, and it's known as the circle of Willis. In most strokes, thrombotic or hemolytic occur at that circle. So if you're familiar with this circle, if you're familiar with what will be there, think of it. Look at right here. If I'm in the, the lateral arch of the circle, the communicating out of here, so they say, well, the post Posterior communicating artery has suffered a lesion. What would I see in vision? What do I have sitting here? Optic traffic. Let me figure that out. Medial vision on one eye, lateral on the other would be effective. So the patient comes in, you say, that's kind of weird. They're not really in a full stroke yet. They're getting there with maybe you know, transient ischemic attacks. I lose vision here and here. And then it comes back. And then it gets funny. And then I These are things you're going to hear. It's not going to come in. It's not going to come and say, oh, by the way, I'm going to stroke here because my eyes are broken. I'm not going to say that to you. You're going to get bits and pieces, and you're the detective to put it together. Is this case serious that's here right now, or are we just tell them to go home and the doctor will need to see it? You follow what I'm saying to you? And as you guys get further into it, you're the primary care people of the future. By 2020, you're the primary care people. Nobody's becoming primary doctors anymore. You can't make a living at it. Their adjusted gross incomes are well under six figures. Just the gross means what you take home with you. Not the gross of the practice. I mean, I don't know the problem. We were grossing sometimes two and a half million a year when we were in that. That was the gross of the practice between five doctors and staff and everything else. When you're walking away with maybe $140,000 a year on a good year. 
Well, most of the time you walked away with maybe a hundred. And now you gotta pay all your personal bills and everything else with that. Which yeah, sounds like a lot, but in today's time it's not a lot. Because I got this you know, there's practitioner friends and PA friends that are making more than that in hospitals. And my sister was a nurse and nurse this up in Boston. She was making two hundred twenty-five thousand a year. Nurse practitioner in essence. Two twenty-five a year working a thirty-hour work week. No weekends, no holidays. I'm called once a month on the weekend. You pay for that. You know, you're not at the hospital. You pay for it. Where doctors are not part of the probably a practice to get shit. You don't want to go out and sit and see people look too bad, no weekend, you get nothing. Your salary. Follow what I'm saying? You guys in the future. Let me the day you become a, student, a nurse, a school nurse. You work the same hours as a teacher who left because you don't have to keep kids out to school. You don't have to do homework. You're just there during the day when the kids need to see a nurse. Work the same skill, same pay scale as a teacher. So you might start off shitty, but 10 years in, you're attending school nurse, you're making 84,000 a year. And what's the start from doing a couple of per diem shit? Easy making stuff about 20 a year, but I'm killing myself. Summer's off. Every vacation, every hour, off. Thanksgiving Day, off. So you want to work Thanksgiving Day because you don't have any family? Go ahead. You got to make a good shitload of money as a nurse coming in that day. You follow what I'm saying to you? You have so much opportunity. Nursing's the one of all these careers that are offered, and nursing's the one that brings in so many different directions where the other fields can't. So it's a great field for that. Tired of being in the hospital, go do something else as a nurse. Tired of being in the orphan insurance industry, be the prick that says no to everything and take it off. And out. But I'm showing you the importance of this. So just keep this picture in your mind yourself. I'm not going to go into this detail and stuff. But keep this picture with you somehow for the summer. Look at it. Look at your cranial nerves and look at this picture. And really get comfortable with it. So you can figure out. So when you get the med surgery too, in your second semester of nursing, you're going to say, I know this shit. Biggest thing in the problem, atherosclerosis. What is this hardening in the old times? I got hardening in arteries in my head. Well, the artery is hardening because it's calcifying due to damage from inflammation. The bottom line is that the biggest damage to the endothelium, we damage the endothelium, inflammation sets in. And you know that stress, a pressure changes in the system. Okay? Look at this. Our friend, the LDL. One that is sad is supposed to attack. Doesn't generally the statin knock out the LDL a bit? Yeah, it does. But doesn't always raise the HDL major? No, big no. Want to raise the LDL? Olive oil. The true Mediterranean diet is a nice job on it. HDL raise. Yeah, we're going to be a vegetarian, we'll like olive oil. We're going to use it so it doesn't bother you. Put it on your eggplant and get real and be nice. Go big thing with olive oil and garlic is delicious. I don't know if you're making this up. It's so much easier. I don't have to peel on the way. It's like... Oh, it's awesome, isn't it? Yes, it is. Wow. You know what I mean? You know, you're going to go have a scale with some egg on the side, right? But it is great. It's a healthy thing. A lot of protein in it. Everything you need is in that sandwich. It's awesome. But, and, you got, and it's a great LDL fighter at the same time. Not bad for you. You grilled it. You fry the shit. You grilled it with a little olive oil to keep it from drying up. But that's a big problem, the LDL. But, and then what's the other one? This! And usually people who do this have this. They're sitting in the bar room, drinking a keg of beer, puffing away, eating a bowl of peanuts and potato chips. Right? And they don't understand why he's so strong and healthy. Why did he die of a heart attack? I had a stroke when he was 50 years old. And he never went to the doctor. He was so healthy, he never went to the doctor in 30 years when he dropped dead. Well, I wonder why he dropped dead. So he never picked a guy out of the mechanic for 30 years. Don't do anything to it. Not going to last 30 years. Follow my point? Yeah, you need to go get checked. 
on a yearly basis. Most things that will kill you are hidden. High blood pressure is a hidden problem. LDL being through the roof is a hidden problem. And that creates inflammation. So we damage, the basic line is this, we're damaging the endothelium. That's what I want you to get out of this. These two things are damaging the endothelium, they're creating inflammation, and when you create inflammation, what do you, what do you draw to the area? White blood cells. The whole histamine, cysteine problem starts with the cytokine release coming out of homocysteine, which is bad. So that's why the one thing that Ferguson has done right is the immunoglobulin aspirin a day. It does a big thing in stopping a lot of this damage. That's one thing they've done right. That I believe you. It's not only because it keeps platelets from sticking together, but it also stops the inflammation at the endothelial lining of these arteries, which will stop the whole process. And what's going to happen? As the blood gets stuck there, and you've got inflammation around it, it starts to calcify, embed itself into the wall of the artery, and you finally look like this. Beautiful. It's like a hard drain pipe. Look at the old lead drain pipes. The new plastic ones don't fly like that. Stuff don't stick to it. And the material they use. Looks like sewage. How are they going to move blood through that? And then a piece of it flocks off and pfft. The most common area you'll see with people, who knows anybody who's had an end on a rectum he's done? Run down a reason to love Come. And when they put a stethoscope here, Usually there's a normal heat sound from the heart. But we have what they call a gooey, which sounds like a mirror over here. You get, you get the occlusion. They're going to say the doctor studies. If the occlusion is bad enough, you just put your blood through, you're going to have surgery. Because eventually you're going to occlude enough and nothing's going to get to the brain. So this all builds on itself. Now, is it possible to eat a big high fat meal and drop dead the next day? No. Not the next day, a few hours later, yeah. Why? Last thing is any business worth done. Why? Because you know what it'll do if you put too much fat in you at one time? You inhibit the process of cutting down the platelets from that they can't stick to one another on, on its own, and they agglutinate instantly. And people with cardiac conditions will overeat can reduce a heart attack in yourself. So keep that in your mind. The last thing to talk about is this aneurysm. What is the aneurysm? Well, we can stop with that hardening in the artery and we weaken the wall. Blood starts trickling and pushing its way that it's finally only under the external layer and it starts bulging out. It's like a ballooning of a major vessel. The most common is the iliacs and the aorta. And the other common uh, inside the head, in that circle of willis, to get them there. Now they can clip head on, right? Yes. They clip the order. No. So what they do is they go inside this with a, a huge stent that opens up like an umbrella, and they'll go in here, it opens up in here, and they can remove this. So that's the new procedure they do. This one is coactation of the aorta. This is bad. This would be affecting this subclavian on this side. So you get what they call subclavian steel syndrome. And when that starts happening, you're getting less blood supply on one side and onto the brain, and you get a huge difference in blood pressure between right and left arms. That's why in general doctors should take them on both sides and be done with it's too much work. If you go to your fashion way, you can put it out and bump it on the ass on the side. And this is what it really looks like. Look at that. This is the normal artery size right here. This. Shut the lights down so you can see. This. There it is, right here. Look at it. There's the artery here and the abdominal. Look at this. The abdominal aneurysm. So the aneurysm is in the box. There's this big bone right here. This is not the heart. That's an aneurysm. Oh, shit. <laughs> All right, this is, this is a piece of the artery here. So they're suturing in to clamp down to go in here and get the side back. That artery before the burst. And these can be painful depending on where they are, and they can pulsate. So how would you feel in someone with a real big one who's like thin wall, you know, thin wall, like most of these 
most of the females in this class. And when they're laying on their back, you literally can palpate your downward aorta. And you go right on each side of the belly button, push straight down like this. The belly button's in the middle, straight down on each side of it, push straight down, and you feel a pulsing hitting your fingers coming from here, from the down aorta. If you feel the pulse doing this, you most likely have an aneurysm. And as the person gets older and starts to calcify, you visualize that on a regular flat plane x and I've seen that. People come in with back pain. And you take an x-ray, a big aneurysm in there. Back pain is coming from that big aneurysm. Call the guy, say, right? Send him right over. I'm not even touching this person. Goodbye. I didn't even touch him once. If that thing holds up on the way out of here, it's not my fault. Fine. Okay, so that's an aneurysm. An aneurysm is nothing but a weakening of the internal wall of the artery. And the blood seeps in under the outside layer. It makes it like a balloon and balloons out. That's all it is. And what can create it even faster is when that artery gets damaged from atherosclerosis and weakens it more. Why? You lose your flexibility. The elastin fibers are calcifying, so they don't work anymore. Okay? And with that, we're done with vascular. So the next thing will be real easy to hit. You know, it looks like we're probably going to go Friday. We'll see how we do on Wednesday. Friday, I hate to see on your review so late. The day of the final is, is May 11th, 8.30 in the morning. Well, May 11th is May 11th.